If you got your Bible, go to Luke, Luke, Luke chapter 12. That's page 1076 in the church Bible under your chairs. Feel free to grab a church Bible if you, uh, if you do not have a Bible with you today. Luke chapter 12. I want everybody to see it, so we really are big on that. Bring in your Bible or at least using the Bible under the chairs. That's why we put them there. We want you to see it, you know. Don't just believe me. Be- believe what the Bible says. And so Christmas is almost here. Did you guys know that? How many of you would, well, I'm not even going to ask this. I was going to ask how many of you are stressed out over something right now, but I'm not going to ask because probably most of us won't be honest. But (laughs) as I speak, some of you are stressed out because you still have gifts to buy, you know, or you're worried about a gift that you might or might not receive and get. And some of you do the finances in your family and you're already worried about the credit card bills, right? Coming in. Uh, So what is going to really define Christmas 2018 for you? Will, let me ask you something. Is it, what's going to define your Christmas this year? Will it really be, think about this. Is, it, is your Christmas really going to be defined by the possessions that you give or receive? I don't think so. I mean, let's face it. Most gifts that we give or that we receive are going to end up in a few places, right? They're, they're going to end up in the back of the closet. They're going to end up in the garbage one day. One day they'll end up at the city dump. One day they'll end up at a rummage sale, a thrift store. Many people will take a gift and then return it, right? And it's like, you know, no humongous things are going to probably come because of gifts given. Your Christmas isn't going to be defined by the gifts that you give or receive. They're great. Nothing wrong with it. It's wonderful, fun. You know, it's a way to express love. But it's not something that's going to define your Christmas. Saw a little video. We'll dim the lights and show this. A little two-minute video. I thought it was kind of funny. It's, it's humorous. Watch this. Christmas presents are exciting. Do you remember what you'd say is the best gift you've ever received at Christmas? I asked my kids this question, and here's what they said. My six-year-old loved her little talky doll that could talk, blink, and not much else. Cost a whopping $110 after tax, and it lasted for a solid eight months before it found its way to the back of her closet. My nine-year-old said his favorite was the popular fantasy book series, six books in all, each getting progressively longer. The set cost $58 and lasted eight weeks before it lived its final dust-filled existence on a shelf. Now, my tween loved the Brainy Putty Collection that cost $32 and lasted a measly eight days before it went to live in our carpet. Finally, my teenage son wanted the ultimate drone with a 4K camera. It cost the most and lasted the shortest amount of time. I'd like to say it lasted eight minutes, but no, it was eight seconds, which is only impressive in bull riding. As exciting as those gifts are, what if there was a gift at Christmas that was far better? In fact, so much better that it makes these look like, well, toys. What if this gift was worth so much that no one could buy it for you, nor could you afford it? What if it was something of extreme value, like, say, life itself? And what if this gift was given through the birth of a baby who became our paid in full? That's the gift offered to all. It costs us nothing, him everything. It lasts just a bit longer than eight seconds, eight days, eight weeks, or even eight months. It lasts forever. Isn't that good? Amen. So true. You know, it's so true. Here's the good news. Gifts and possessions do not have to define your Christmas this year. In fact, they shouldn't define your Christmas because these things are fleeting. I remember the one gift I really remember from childhood was one year I got a puppy. It was awesome, but the puppy got ran over by a car, and (laughs) so I had it a couple years, I mean, but it didn't last, (laughs) you know, Um, and and that's the thing. I mean, gifts don't last. I'm just being honest, you know. I, I want us to examine a text today in which Jesus shares a story with us to make a point that I think really pertains to Christmas in our culture in a big-time way. 
In verse number 16, uh, it says there, look at that. It says, and he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them. All the word parable means is a story. The Bible says that Jesus told them a story. Jesus was a great storyteller. If you've read the Gospels much, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was good at telling stories. And Jesus told a story, but he always told them to make a point. And what was the point of this story? Well, let's read it first. Look at verse 16. It says, he spake a parable, a story unto them, saying, here we go. You ready? The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. This is a rich dude, man. He thought within himself. He said, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Man, I got so much stuff, I don't know what to do with it. Verse 18, he said, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and I'll build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you got much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, you fool, this night your soul shall be required of thee. In other words, you're going to die. Then who shall those things be that you've provided? So Jesus tells this story, and what's the point? Well, there are three incredible slam dunk points that Jesus is going to make that's really going to encourage us this Christmas season. And here's the first one. You ready? I want you to get these. They're so important. Number one is this. God does not define you by your possessions. Isn't that the overarching theme of this story? Look at verse number 21. I didn't read that verse. I wanted to save it. This is what he says right after he tells the story. Okay, everybody look at it. Look at verse 21 and look what he says right after he tells the story. So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. There are two ways to live life, rich toward yourself or rich towards God. People may try and define you by your possessions, where you live, what kind of car you drive, what kind of clothes you wear. People may try to define you by your possessions, but God never does. God defines a person by what's in their heart. In your handout, look at it with me in your handout there. And notice that 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? On the heart. God is not one bit impressed with a person's wealth. In fact, I, I thought about this when I was writing this message. I said, God never does a double take when he sees somebody's car that they're driving. You know what I mean? Like, like people do. You know, God never goes, whoa, they're driving a, that's a $100,000 car. God never does that. He doesn't care. He couldn't care less what they're driving, you know? God never does a double take at the brand name on somebody's clothes. God never does a double take at jewelry somebody's wearing. God never does a double take at the house that somebody's living in. Whoa, look at that house. God looks right down into the heart. As the old saying goes, God gets to the heart of the matter. Amen, church? So why do we tend to de define people this way? Because it's not godly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's ungodly, right? When we try to define people by their possessions. In fact, the Bible teaches that we lack godly wisdom when we define people this way. James 2 one through nine is all about that. I'm going to paraphrase it. James writes to the church. He says, hey, church, have not the faith of Jesus Christ with respect of persons. That means showing favoritism to some. And then he gives an illustration. He says, if a man comes into your church and he's got a real fancy gold ring and he's got real expensive clothes, and then another guy comes into your church with just old nasty clothes on, and then you show favoritism to the guy with the fancy clothes and the jewelry. And you say to him, hey, come over here, man. Got the best seat in the house for you. And then you say to the poor man, you know what? There's a place over there in the corner where you can stand. He says, are you not partial and become judges of evil thoughts? Hey, he says, listen, church. Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to them that love him? He says, if you love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, he said, you commit sin. What is James saying? Here's what he's saying. And I'm just going to kind of bring this down to a level I think we could all grab a hold of. James is saying, if there's a person in the church 
who makes a quarter of a million dollars a year. And you got another person in the church who's struggling to make ends meet. They make $20,000 a year. Those two, if they know the Lord, they ought to be comfortable fellowshipping with each other. Why? Because God doesn't define us by our wealth and by our possessions, and we shouldn't define each other that way. I mean, if two people are believers, if both those guys are believers in Christ, it shouldn't feel awkward. It shouldn't feel weird for them to fellowship and to be together. They're in Christ together. They love the same Lord. We don't want to be like the church at Laodicea. You say, well, where's that at? The church at Laodicea is in the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, God rebukes that church for this very thing, this idea of thinking that their possessions define them. And in your handout, I took a little snippet from that passage. Look at it with me, Revelation 3.17. This is God addressing that church, those people. And he says, because you say, this is what they say, I'm rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. He says, and know not, this is what God thinks, that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Do you see how God does not define us by our possessions? God looks at these people right down into their hearts. He looks right down into their hearts. And he says, you know what? You think you're really great because you're rich and you're increased with goods. But God says, when I look at you, I don't see that. I see people who are very pitiful. I see people who are miserable and they're poor and they're naked and they're wretched. God looks down into our hearts. And hopefully on Christmas, this Christmas, 2018, hopefully there won't just be a bunch of gifts around the tree, although that's fine, but hopefully there won't be just a bunch of gifts around your tree. Hopefully there'll be a bunch of people with hearts for God and a love for Jesus and a true thankfulness for the amazing grace of his provision. God does not define you by your possessions. That's what we learn from the story of the rich fool. God does not, you know, this guy was rich. God said, you're a fool. God does not define you by your possessions. Are you all with me? Say amen, huh? Amen. All right, we're already moving on to number two. All right, the second thing we learn from this that Jesus teaches us, this is a biggie. Quality of life is not defined by your possessions. If young people could get that through their heads, I'm talking about those of you in here who are 25 and younger. If you guys, and I mean, old people need it too, like me, old people like me, all right? But if, if young people could get that through their heads when they're young, I'm going to tell you they would be on their way to living a very fulfilled life. That, that quality of life is not defined by your possessions. That's another major point that Jesus was making to these people in a culture that was a lot like ours today. They thought in that culture that the more they had, the happier they would be. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the context of this story, and we're going to see what Jesus said, what led him to tell this story. Look at verse 15, all right? Look at that. He says, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Jesus says that right before he tells them this story. And what's interesting is that you know why Jesus said that? We got to go up to verse 13 to see that the reason why Jesus made that statement is because of two brothers that were arguing over stuff. In fact, they were arguing over their parents' stuff. Look at verse number 13. Let's look at this. It says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, Jesus, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Two brothers that have locked horns, 
and they're angry and they're upset over stuff. Do you think that kind of thing still goes on today? <laughs> you know what? They didn't have cars and planes back then, but people haven't changed, amen? Amen. <laughs> The Bible is just as relevant today as it was when it was written, amen? I mean, I've been pastoring here, senior pastor for 25 years, been here 30, ministering, and it amazes me. People, I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over. People will sacrifice relationships and dispose of them like a paper towel over stuff, and it's crazy. It's... It, it's absolutely crazy. People are obsessed with things, you know? And, and, and it's because they think that it's going to make them happy. They think it's going to make them content. And so Jesus <laughs> answers the brother <laughs> who's saying, Jesus, go to bat for me. Jesus, go to bat for me against my brother. And that he divide the inheritance with me. And so he, he wants Jesus to go to bat. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to get involved in this. But you, friend, need to beware of covetousness because your life is not about your possessions. And then, boom, he tells him the story about the rich fool. You ever ask a question and wish you hadn't asked it? <laughs> that brother may be thinking, I wish I'd keep my mouth shut. Jesus loaded his wagon, didn't he? I mean, this guy's like, I, you know, his, his, his guy is like, you go to bat for me, Jesus. Jesus is like, no, I'm not going to go to bat for you, but here's what I am going to tell you. And boom, I mean, he just nails it. And here's the thing, and, and the quality of your life is not going to be dependent on your possessions. The quality of your, if you could get this, it will help you so much. I'm telling you, it, it, will, it will revolutionize your life if you can take this. And I hope young people in here will take this. And, and I hope you will nail this thing to your, to, to, you know, to your mirror. Well, don't nail it. Stick it to your mirror. Um, <laughs> but, but I hope that you'll put that on your mirror. I hope that you'll take this message home with you and put it before you where you'll never forget it. The quality of your life is going to be largely based on two things. Number one, it's in your handout. Number one, your relationship with Jesus. If you... Neglect that. There is going to be a void in your life. And you are not going to truly have joy in your life. You were built and created by him to have a relationship with him. And I'm telling you, he doesn't just want to be your savior and give you, you know, uh, fire insurance. Listen, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And if you neglect that and you do not walk with him and you do not allow him to be Lord of your life, there's going to be a major void. The quality of your life will greatly diminish. Number two, the second thing that's going to determine the quality of your life is your relationship with others. All right? That's what's going to do it. I'm telling you, listen, uh, it doesn't matter. You, it, what would be better to, to, to live... You can live in a small house, but you know what? You can't live your life with just broken relationship after broken relationship. You know? You can drive an old clunker. Nothing wrong with that. You'll be fine. But you can't deal with a broken down marriage. It's going to be miserable for you in your life. You're not going to be happy. The quality of your life is going to diminish. You know? You, you, can, you can live with old clothes, old worn out, out of style clothes. You can live. You'll survive. But you know what? It's going to be hard for you to survive if you don't invest time in those kids and, and, and be there for them. They're going to break your heart. Invest in relationships with people. That's what it's all about. You don't have to have the best of this, a big house. And you don't have to have all that. If you do, that's fine. But you don't have to have all that to be happy. I'm telling you, your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with others, that's the key to the quality of your life. Jesus said, your life is not about the things that you possess. And you know what that phrase means? It literally means things in hand, possessions, and property. Jesus said the quality of your life is not about the things you hold in your hand, 
the property you own or the possessions that you possess. And isn't that true? In your handout, it says that the best things in life, money cannot buy. The best things in life, money cannot buy. When's the last time you went to Walmart or Target and saw a sale on joy? <laughs> we got a great sale going on joy. You can buy it right over on aisle you know, 12. No, you can't buy joy. You can't buy peace. You can't buy peace, inner peace. You can't buy peace in your relationships with people. You can't buy inner peace with yourself. You can't buy it. It's not for sale. You can't buy contentment. You cannot buy good and healthy relationships. Oh, you can buy relationships. And there are people who will be your friends as long as you have stuff. And when the stuff's gone, where are they going to be? You can buy relationships, but you can't buy good and healthy relationships. That you can't buy. You can't buy love. You can't buy a relationship with God. The best things in life, you can't buy with money. Yet materialism says just the opposite. Materialism says that physical matter is the only reality. Hear me now. That's materialism. Physical matter. What I can see, taste, handle, smell. Physical matter is the only reality. That's materialism. In other words, all that matters in life are the material things that you acquire and possess. What did Jesus say? He said, a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Later on in this chapter, he said, the life is more than meat, the body is more than raiment. Jesus boldly refutes materialism, and he says, there is more to life than your stuff. Yet people live this way. But it makes a miserable way to live life because you're basically a slave to your stuff. Whatever it is you want next, right? And there's always something next. There's always something you want next, you know? I mean, it's like, why? Because things wear out, things break, things get stolen. The thing that you wanted that would make you happy um, wears out, isn't cool anymore. Isn't it amazing the things that we bought over the last 30 years, those of you who've been along that long? Isn't it amazing the things that we bought that we thought was really cool and now they're not cool anymore? <laughs> you know, we thought that car was really cool, but guess what? That 1978 Oldsmobile isn't cool anymore. You know, and, and that, that flip phone that was so cool back in the day, now people make fun of you because you have a flip phone, right? Those of you who have flip phones still, <laughs> you still got a flip phone. <laughs> there was a day we thought that was cool, man. <laughs> I, I got a flip phone. <laughs> you know, and now people are like, <laughs> you got a flip phone. <laughs> you know, and we had to have that flip phone, you know. And uh, clothes that you bought that you thought were so cool, you know, and now people laugh, you know. It's like there's always something next, right? And, and that's materialism. Typically, people who live a materialistic life leave a trail of broken relationships behind them. And when the story of your 2018 Christmas is written and in the books, the quality and the measure of it won't be determined by what's under the tree. No, it's about what's in the heart. And it's about the Christ-like love of your relationships. So what have we learned from this story? We learned, number one, God does not define you by your possessions. Hallelujah. We learned, number two, quality of life. Quality of life is not defined by your possessions. It's about your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with people around you. That's the quality of your life. The third thing we learn is this. Last point. Ready? Number three. The third thing we learn from this story is this. How you die is not defined by your possessions. How you die is not defined by your possessions. Everybody awake? Y'all listening? We said that materialism is a miserable way to live life, but guess what? It's also a miserable way to die. In your handout, it says that this man in the story 
was rich, but he died as a fool. He died as a fool. The, the, and my point is this. The rich man's wealth did nothing to change his eternal state. He died as a fool, lost and without God. Okay? He died, listen, he died with no relationship with God and no record of any loving relationship with people. He died as a fool. So Jesus gives like a, a real life illustration here to make his point. And I mean, he pins the tail on the donkey, so to speak. He nails it. He explains what real life is and how covetousness can destroy that. And you know what? There are so many people with tons of material wealth that are all alone. And the sad part is they'll either die alone or they'll have family or, quote, friends who are literally moving in at the last minute and hovering over them, waiting for them to die so they can get their hands on their stuff. And it, I have seen it. It is sickening and sad. It's just nasty, you know, friends and, they're, they're, and family that come in. And it's like, it's so sad. There's a song that I heard that had a statement in it that really impacted me. And when I first heard the song, I, it, it was one of those it was words, you know, that kind of went boom. And I got them on the screen, and here's what the word said. You can ask a dying man what he'd rather hold, a tender, loving hand or a pot of gold. My, I think that, like, the greatest thing ever for me, and Denise and I have talked about this, I think the greatest thing that could ever happen is that we would go at the same time and have spent our last cent right before we died. <laughs> it's all gone. So that we could know whoever's at our bedside really loves us. <laughs> they're not hovering over us waiting for anything because they're not going to get a dime, you know. That would be like the ultimate way to leave, you know. And you know everyone in the room is there because they love you, you know. And that, that song, it goes on to say, Loving is what living is all about. It's the giving, not the taking, that makes life worthwhile. And then it says, when we're living without loving, we're living without. Loving is what living is all about. Love people. Don't worry about stuff. Love people. What's going to define your 2018 Christmas? Listen, when you're out shopping, nothing wrong with that. Like I said, you can give gifts as an expression of love. That's awesome. But when you're out shopping, you're putting up decorations, love them. When you're adorning the tree, family tradition at our house, love it. When you're preparing for Christmas, that's great. But I want you to remember the story that Jesus told. And I want you to remember three things that we learn here about stuff and possessions. Let's keep it all in perspective. What did we learn? Number one, God does not define you by your what? He looks right down into your heart. He defines you by what's in your heart. Number two, quality of life is not defined by your what? Possessions. The quality of your life will be determined by your relationship with Jesus and your relationship with those around you. That's what's going to determine. And I've tried to hammer that in my kids. <laughs> Man, I have tried so much to hammer that in my three boys. Is that, guys, you know what? Like I said, you can, you can drive a broken down car. Who cares? You can live in a small house your whole life. Who cares? But you know what? The quality of your life is going to be defined by your relationships with people and with Jesus. Get that. Number three, how 
you die is not defined by your what? His actions. This morning, I want you to get that last statement. What, what's the bottom line in this? Here it is. You ready? It's in your handout. Invest in people and in relationships. As you learn the Bible, it should change the way you live and love. That's what life is all about. That's what our mission's about at Crossroads. Loving Jesus and loving others. How? By learning the Bible and living the Bible. As you learn the Bible, it ought to cause you to love Jesus and love people more. Amen, church? So the question is, what will define your Christmas? Well, hopefully, again, it won't be stuff. Hopefully, it'll be these relationships. Let's go to the Lord.